to tube. It is uh, my pleasure to present my student, Shahar Karmeli from Weizmann Institute. And he will tell us about we'll starting this slide on YouTube. He will tell us about the relative drum theorem for Nash submersions, which is a joint work with Avram Meisenbrot. He will join us soon. Okay. So, uh, hi, everyone. Um, so, uh, this is a an online seminar, if there are any technical problems, you can see what I write or anything, please let me know. And also, uh, I prefer to less to tell less things which will be clear than, than more unclear things. So please ask questions if anything is unclear or you have any other question. Um, so uh, what I will tell you today is a work in progress. It joined with uh, Avram Eisenbad. And uh, before I start telling you what, uh, what we are doing, let me start by telling you some things you probably already know, uh, just to put us in the uh, rhyme, uh, right uh, context. So um, we are talking about uh, the RAM theorems. The RAM theorems are about uh, comparing uh, certain uh, homologies, cohomologies, cohomologies with compact support, depending on normalizations, uh, arising from topology with such that arise uh, from, a, from a smooth structure or, or any other a restriction of analytic structure based on something differentiable. So uh, before uh, we get uh, to talk about uh, new stuff, let me tell you about some uh, more old stuff. So if we have a smooth manifold X, uh, then of course uh, I have the Durham complex of X. And then I can take the smooth sections. So this is a, I don't know, a complex of, uh, let's say, sheaves on X. And we can take the smooth um, the smooth sections or I don't know, a complex of, uh, of term-wise vector bundles and differential, differential operators between them. So it makes sense to take the smooth sections. And then the RAM theorem uh, tells us that that thing computes correctly the singular, the topological cohomology of X with coefficients in R. So that's we already know. And, and of course, if, um, if we want to compute the uh, cohomology with compact support, then what we need to take is uh, smooth sections with compact support. Uh, well, this is for smooth manifold. Suppose now, for example, that our manifold has a semi-algebraic structure, namely X is now a Nash manifold. And then uh, this complex, the Durham complex, has a structure, um, has a structure, uh, well, term-wise, of a Nash bundle, bundle because uh, uh, a vector bundle of differential forms is natural in whatever structure you put on X. In particular, if X has semi-algebraic structure, then this bundle will, ha will have a semi-algebraic structure as well. And well, from a work of uh, Duclos, which uh, uh, defined for us um, what are Schwartz functions on a Nash manifold, uh, on a fine Nash manifold, and well, a generalization by Eisenberg and Gurevich uh, for non-affine and po possibly with values in a vector bundle, it makes sense to take now Schwartz sections. So we can alter this and take the Schwartz sections of the Durham complex. And well, it is natural. So, so what do I mean by Schwartz? J just recall, I will not give the formal definition, but that means rather than compactly supported, it's almost compactly supported. It's decaying fast together with all um, derivatives with respect to a uh, um, Nash differential, differential operators, so, or, or even locally. So uh, that means, at least intuitively, that sections of that thing have to uh, decay fast at all possible infinities of X together with all um, derivatives. In particular, that means that if X is compact, for example, that would be just smooth sections and also smooth sections with compact support. And you can ask, yeah? Shahar, can I interrupt you for a second? I, I'm a bit lost in the just the terminology. So the dr of x is a complex of of what? So, so dr of x is is the comp is the complex. Uh, um, so so uh, I will not be very formal, but it's a complex whose terms are uh, vector bundles and who differ whose differentials are, are, are first order differential operators. It's something you can take smooth sections of. Okay, and then, so this isomorphism that you wrote down is, I mean, I just, hard for me to... 
Oh, okay, so uh, what, I, what I mean by this is that uh, yeah. this means that uh, taking the cohomology from left hand side bring you to the right hand side, or if you want, this is a quasi isomorphism in the direct category of real vector spaces. <laughs> okay, uh, which is trivial. So, but, but in any case, what, what I meant by this is that cohomologies of the left hand side give you the right hand side. Okay. Um, well. So uh, I guess it's okay, um, and 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 well, it's a natural question. What 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 is uh, SDR of X? And it turns out to compute the same thing, uh, which is a, a result of Eisenbad and Gurevich, and it's uh, generalized or well, reproven by uh, Luca Prelli. Uh, that uh, well, these two complexes. Well, of course, there is a map from here to here because um, um, Compactly supported function, in particular the k fast at infinity, is just zero in the neighborhood of infinity. And this map is moreover a quasi isomorphism. And um, what do I mean by quasi isomorphism? This is a little uh, subtle point because these complexes are big, they're infinite dimensional and, and carry a natural topologies. But because uh, a posteriori these have uh, finite dimensional cohomologies, it turns out not to be. Uh, that bad, and well, these two complexes canonically compute the same cohomology, which is just the compactly supported um, cohomology of X. Um, so there are many possible uh, variants of that thing. Uh, for example, we can add a local system to the whole uh, to the whole story and compute the compactly supported or the Schwarz cohomology with values in a uh, Local system, and again, the two things uh, will agree. Um, so uh, th that's what I mean by the absolute the Ram theorem uh, Schwarz version. Um, so uh, this is very nice. Uh, well, it's not very. Uh, I mean, a, a posteriori, it's not extremely surprising because we have a map between the two complexes, and once we have a canonical map between complexes. Usually, the problem of showing that they are quasi isomorphic becomes easier if we already constructed a map. Um, so, uh, just a small observation about uh, this issue. Uh, so, what uh, we want to do is we want to have a relative version of this. So, uh, what do I mean by relative version? I mean that we want to replace the Nash manifold X with a family of Nash manifolds, mostly depending on the point of another Nash manifold, which if you think about it just means uh, Nash submersion. Uh, uh, so uh, this brings us to the second uh, part. Uh, so, uh, well, we would like to replace the manifold X with a Nash submersion. And, and well, to be honest, the entire uh, question arised from some specific problem uh, which is the following. So uh, if we have a Nash submersion of two manifolds, of two Nash manifolds, then if we have a Schwarz, well, function on X, we can attempt to integrate it over the fibers and get a Schwarz function on Y. So we would like to have some operation of integration along the fibers. Of course, this is not something that makes sense because we cannot integrate functions. But if we take a uh, Schwarz sections of uh, the bundle of measures on X, then we can push forward measures and get get again Schwarz measures on Y. So we have an operation uh, from Schwarz measures. I will denote by S M uh, the collection of Schwarz measures on X to Schwarz measures on Y. And well, in fact, the Schwarz measures on X uh, is the last term of a natural complex, which is up to a shift in normalization just the Ram complex of F, or more precisely, it's Schwarz sections, which is the following. We can take Schwarz measures on X and then Schwarz measure on X with coefficients in the relative tangent uh, bundle and go on and on. And well, again, up to a, um, a shift and uh, maybe a local system, this complex is just uh, the relative the Ram complex of F, but because it's not precisely, I will denote it by SDR twisted of it because uh, it's uh, twisted by an invertible uh, an invertible uh, object on X, which is a local system and the shift. 
And well, of course, if you take the exterior, the 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 derivative, the, the d of a, a smooth smooth measure valued in the tangent in the relative tangent, and then you integrate it over the fiber, well, this is the integral of a derivative of something that decays fast. So the total integral will be zero. So uh, in particular, the integral um, become now a map from the entire complex of a twisted uh, relative the arm complex of F to uh, the space of Schwartz measures on Y. And well, intuitively, uh, the, the relative the RAM complex takes into account the topology of the fibers. And if the topology of the fibers is trivial, we expect this map to be an, is an isomorphism, meaning at least to induce an isomorphism on the uh, homologies of these two complexes. And well, this question rises uh, naturally when thinking about stuff like Schwartz uh, measures on uh, Nash text, which, which was our original motivation. I will not go, get into the details of why this is relevant to this question, but uh, this was something we started to do with uh, uh, Sakelaridis, Eisenbad, and Gurevich. And then uh, we saw that this problem naturally arises and started to think about it. Well, at first, this kind of, and the question is the following. So um, suppose the fibers of F are contractible, or let's say a cyclic uh, homologically, like for, for, for real homology of the underlying topological space, is this map an isomorphism? Um, and and yeah. For, yeah? Uh, SM of Y, is it a group or a complex? No, no, th this one is a, is a single topological vector space, okay? And that thing is a complex of topological vector spaces and the map between them, just think of SM of Y as being a complex concentrated in a single, in zero, in, a, in position zero in the complex. Okay, okay? so the com when you say the cohomologies of SM of Y... Uh, I just mean SM of Y in degree zero and zero everywhere else. Okay. Great. So uh, in other words, uh, is SDRT of F can be thought of as a resolution of SM of Y, which is the original motivation. We wanted to resolve things like smooth measures on complicated things by relative the round complexes of, of maps, mapping from things which are simpler. So uh, it is natural to ask whether this map uh, is an equivalence. And, and let me uh, tell you already, the answer, answer is yes. And well, at the beginning, when I just looked at it, it looked so um, intuitive that it's deceivingly uh, seems trivial because we are very much used to the idea that a submersion uh, is something that is locally looks like a projection from a product with a ren. Unfortunately, in, um, and, and, and for, for, for such a situation, of course, the statement is true. Um, but, but unfortunately, in, in semi-algebraic geometry, this is almost the case, but not quite. So um, uh, let me tell you what, what is the issue with this question. Why is it not precisely trivial? And, and there are several things that make this question a little bit complicated. First of all, one, one should ask where those things should be equivalent. And the point is that both the right-hand side and the left-hand side, the source and the target of the integral, are, are complexes of, of topological, of, of Frechet spaces, of topological vector spaces. And um, the notion of a quasi-isomorphism for such is not uh, as nicely behaved as for a billion groups or real vector spaces. There are uh, some subtleties. For example, we definitely want this map to be not only a quasi-isomorphism, but also a, a continuous quasi-isomorphism. We want the homologies um, to have the same topology. And, 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 and in fact, uh, this yes is not only yes. In fact, one can show even more, one can show that the integral of over f in this case is actually a homotopy equivalence. Uh, homotopy equivalence of complexes of topological vector spaces, which is uh, in some sense a better behaved notion in a non abelian situation than, than quasi isomorphism. Um, so so that, that's first issue. The other issue is, is the following. So, so I said that locally every nice submersion is supposed to look like a projection from a product with a rent. But um, on the other hand, uh, this kind of results, one, we already have a map. We usually try to prove them by using some local model. So, so we, are, we want to use a local model of F as being some sort of projection from a product. So 
But this statement is global. And in order to prove it, we need to localize it. We need to be able to make a claim which localize well with respect to open covers of X. Unfortunately, we also have a very uh, global demand of contractable fibers, which is not something that localize well. So we want somehow a variant, a more general statement than this statement that will uh, be true for an arbitrary nest immersion and, and, and also will, uh, we will be able to localize and that will also take into account the homotopy type of the complexes and not only the quasi-isomorphism type. So uh, let me first tell, uh, you, tell you a heuristic of what left-hand side, uh, right-hand side of the equation should be replaced by. And the idea is that intuitively, the relative the RAM complex is supposed to compute something like the homologies of the phylum. So we would like to uh, twist the right-hand side by something that takes into account the homologies of the fiber. In particular, for example, if F is an open embedding, we would not like to have the smooth measures on the entire target, but only on the image. So uh, what is the idea? The idea is that we want SDR T of F not to be the smooth measures on the entire X, but rather on some weighted combination of open sets in X that takes into account how many homology we have over every point. So uh, if you like, uh, we would like to have some generalized open set F at which we uh, evaluate the smooth measures in a way that will give us something that take into account the amount of homology over every point. And what this F is supposed to be. So what is a linear combination or some weighted sum of open sets? That is just a constructible complex. So we would like to have some notion of smooth, smooth measure valued not on an open set of a Nash manifold, but rather on a constructible sheaf, where by constructible sheaf, I mean a complex of sheaves with constructible cohomologies that will depend only on the quasi-exomorphism type of F and uh, will have some nice properties that will allow for a theorem like so. Well, F is a, F is a shift on the Y. F, F in this case is a shift on Y, that at every point is supposed to count the amount of homology we have over the relevant point. So, um, well, uh, this, first of all, this will be a theorem. I will discuss it in the very end, but, uh, in order to make this theorem true, uh, we first need to uh, define this notion of what is a smooth measure valued in a constructible sheaf. And there is a very natural way to think about it from classical perspective. And this is the following. Well, if I have a constructible sheaf F, I can attempt to uh, um, resolve it by mean of open, by, by combinations of open sets. And then I just define SM to be the derived functor, namely applying it to the resolution. So we can take like sum over I, RUI, sum over J, RUJ, and choose some resolution like so. And then I will just define the notion on the right hand side just to be applying smooth measures to these direct sums. Well, I will demand formally the smooth measures commute with direct sums of sheets. Um, and then I will get some very explicit co uh, complex to compute. And well, to be honest, this actually works. This gives a definition. The only problem is that it's not clear why it should not depend on a choice of a resolution. Well, you should also know that such a resolution exists, but this is relatively easy. You want to know that it doesn't depend on the resolution. And, and well, usually we get that something doesn't depend on resolution when it is projective. Uh, resolution. Unfortunately, extension by zeros from open sets are not projective objects. They are more like uh, jointly projective in some sense. So uh, in order to witness the projectivity of the family of open sets inside sheaves, one should allow more and more refinements as he goes. And, and well, it is possible, probably possible to open the entire box of derived functors and see what we need from a collection of jointly projective objects to give a well-defined notion. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't want to do it, so I wanted to have some walk around. And uh, well, fortunately, um, in today, 
we don't really need to derive functors to define some things which are derived. There are some more uh, recent technologies that allow to define a functor to begin with and then see that the definition using resolution is actually just a formula for what we have already uh, got. So, um, Shahal? Yeah. Hi. So uh, I'm very slow. I just want to understand the logic. Are you trying to relax this uh, the, the condition on the fibers to get some more general statement that you can localize? Is that the point, or I want to uh, relax the condition on the um, on the fibers to be a vacuous condition. I want to be able to make a statement for all Nash submersions that then I will be able to prove by reducing to the case of a Nash submersion with contractible fibers. But the statement will be localizable so that I can work with maps with contractible fibers which are of very specific shape. That's the strategy. But for this, I need a statement. I need some statement to prove. And the original statement had a condi global condition on the function, so I couldn't use it. So instead, I will cook up some constructible shift F. It's nothing mysterious. It will just be up to a twist by a local system, the push forward of the constant shift with proper support. So F is more or less just the F lower shriek of R. Let's not be uh, too mysterious. Uh, and then, well, uh, this statement will, will be localizable. And then I will actually prove it for submersions for which that thing is actually the constant shift. Okay. So, uh, uh -huh. yeah. Uh, you said that uh, constructible uh, fibers is not a condition that localizes well, but what is the picture there? Why is it not localized well? So, suppose I have a, a Nash manifold. Suppose I have a manifold uh, which is uh, contractible, uh, but I want to uh, have some to prove a theorem about it by, by covering it with some small open balls. So if uh, this manifold is Riemannian, for example, I can choose the balls to be actually convex. And then all the intersections will be contractible as well, and I can remain in the world of contractible things. But in the Nash world, the open sets are not small enough. So you cannot assume, for example, you can cover your things by contractible pieces whose intersections and the threefold intersections and so on, so on are all contractible. Uh, so, so that is that, that is what I mean by not localize well. Okay. So, um, right. So, so, so we really want to make sense of, of of this part, and and also we want something that localizes. So, so both left hand side and right hand side of the, are, are complexes of topological vector spaces. So, so we would really like to say that both sides are actually global sections of well some local object over X, Y. And uh, well, these things doesn't behave like sheaves because they more close to things with compact support, but they do form co-sheaves. So we can define a co-sheaf, SDRT subscript F, which will be a co-sheaf, uh, a co-sheaf on, on X will, with values in something that something is some version of complexes of topological vector spaces. I will not get too much into the details of how to choose this A. Um, you can just, at first approximation, assume this is just the collection of complexes of topological vector spaces. Uh, and, 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 and similarly, we would like some, something cooked out of the shift F and the co-shift of smooth measures on, on Y, and, and I will denote it by the Cauchy of smooth measures on Y tensored with F. And I would like to have a map of Cauchy whose global sections is the equivalence, is the hypothetical equivalence. So um, the, the Cauchy now looks like it lives in different spaces. That is true. And therefore, I will have to push forward the left hand side. Um, right. OK. So formally, I will have to compare the Cauchy fified push forward of. The relative the round complex to most measures on y tensor f. And as I said, we, we can think of the right hand side as being some sort of derived functor of some, well, a uh, um, classical version uh, of a tensor product of a shift and a co shift, which is not particularly classical. By classical, I mean underived. 
Um, but, but on the other hand, my resolutions are not projective. My target category is not abelian. And, and therefore, it seems like all this formalism of the derived functors is not particularly good for treating such problems. So the general idea is that our aim is to replace the conditions that the target category is abelian by the fact that smooth measures are extremely nice cautious. This is because they are sort of flooded. They have a, a partition of unity, which is much stronger than being a Cauchy. And this, that, this brings me to the next idea, and this is to treat both sides as living actually in, not in derived categories on anything or, or something like that, but actually living in infinity categories. So uh, it is impossible to give an introduction to infinity categories in a, a lecture about uh, Schwartz functions uh, in a seminar, but uh, I, I will explain what they are used, why they are useful in this context. So what are infinity categories? First of all, an infinity category is something which is derived. Derived means, for example, that, that, that in the home between two objects in an infinity category, we can see X. We can see derived functors built in into the theory. We can see homologies, for example. We can extract homologies out of an object of the correct infinity category. On the other hand, it is a category by category theory. This means that unlike the usual derived world where we sometimes by accident can compute limits, limits of joints and so on, but they tend to be not the correct objects. That thing behaves just like classical category. We can compute limits in infinity categories. We can compute co-limits. We can use the adjoint functor theorem. We can define sheaves of infinity categories on a space and then use the send arguments and well done correctly, all this just works. So uh, the idea is that when I say that the, the RAM complex live in some categories of sheaves, in some category of sheaves of X with coefficients in A, well, this is a complex of topological vector spaces. And therefore what I mean by this is A is itself a category of complexes of logical vector spaces. Well, there are many uh, technicalities here uh, about the choice of A, and uh, mostly set theoretical that I will just completely ignore. Um, so uh, as I said, infinity categories are, are very nice. And, and now what we aim to do is to uh, produce our map and in particular, make sense of the right-hand side inside the realm of uh, co-sheaves. Uh, well, by this, of course, I mean co-sheaves. Inside the realm of co-sheaves of A-valued co-sheaves on X, where A itself is already an infinity category. Just to give you an example of what, what's going on, in classical theory, what we do is we consider sheaves over X valued in R, in R vector spaces, and then we take the derived category. Here, what we can actually do is to take from the very beginning the category of sheaves on X valued in an infinity category of modules over R. That, that would be just modeled by complexes of real vector spaces. And in this theory, sheaves of complexes and complexes of sheaves are completely different objects. And we want sheaves on, of complexes. So the sheaf condition is different and the, um, the notion of Pre-shift is also different, but uh, I will now try to give some intuition what that means. Uh, but before I do that, let me give you some uh, formal uh, consequences of this idea. So uh, as I said, I wanted to define the notion of a tensile product of a shift and a co-shift. And uh, it raises difficulties when you try to do it by taking a functor on the one categories and then uh, derive. Uh, Tomer asked whether we are considering the infinity category of complexes of the spaces up to homotopy. And the answer is to first approximation, yes. In practice, one need to tweak it a little bit to get something that works well. Um, so, uh, so one natural question is, what is this category of sheaves? And well, for a general topological space or, or a site, this requires to make sense of the notion of 
covering and what does it mean to the send over a covering, but our spaces are very simple, they are Nash manifolds. So if I have a Nash manifold X, I can tell you what is a shift or a co-shift on X. So a shift would be just a functor from the opposite faucet of open sets on X to my target category, which well, in our case of interest, will be for sheaves would be just the category of complexes of real vector spaces. And, and, and the shift condition in this case tell us that something is a shift if it satisfies a uh, male of yetois. So if we have uh, an open set, which is a union of two, and here all the open sets are uh, semi-algebraic open sets and I consider only finite couples. Then uh, a functor like so, a functor in the infinity categorical sense, of course, uh, would be a shift if and only if uh, it satisfies the mayor of Yetoris axiom. So that means that for every way to write an open set as a union of two, then this diagram is a pullback diagram in the infinity category of modules over R, which another way to say is that there is a long exact sequence uh, behaving like Meyer via toys. Uh, similarly, we can define a co-shift and, and one, one way to define a co-shift is just by using ops. So we could define co-shifts of X with coefficients in A to be shifts on X with coefficients in A op op. So just invert the arrows and then invert them again. Like, like in usual situation, but in fact, it will be very good not to think about co-shifts as, as a mere flip of arrows of shifts. Uh, there is a much better formula for the notion of, uh, of a co-shift, which will also give us for free this tensor product operation between shifts and co-shifts. Um, so let me now uh, tell you what it is. So the idea is the following. Suppose uh, I have some category uh, A uh, and I want to define co-shifts on X valued in A. Then, uh, well, to begin with, uh, a co-shift was a, a pre-co-shift, which is a functor from O of X to A. Now, uh, unlike, one of the good things we can do with infinity categories is that we can use uh, limits and co-limits and we can require functors to preserve them. And in particular, there it makes sense to extend a, a functor by continuity by forcing it to preserve co-limits. So in particular, if I have a functor like so, where all of X could be in principle any infinity category, and the target A has all co-limits, which will force A to be something slightly different from the category of complexes of topological vector spaces, but well, I don't want to get into the precise way to do it. We can choose A to have all co-limits. Uh, or our problem. Uh, then it turns out that we have the Oneda embedding of O of X into uh, the pre-shifts on O of X. By pre-shift, I mean, usually we think of pre-shifts as being valued in sets. In infinity category, there is another notion, which is functors into a specific infinity category called spaces. But for us, this would be good to think about it as just the infinity category freely generated by the poset O of X under all co-limits. And then it turns out that if I have any functor f, then I can always extend it uh, in a unique way by demanding that it preserves uh, co-limits uh, from the pre-shift category. This is just because the pre-shift category is a free construction. It's really generated under co-limits. Now you can ask what is the condition on f to be a, a co-shift because what I did now was uh, something I can do for an arbitrary functor. And it turns out that I can define also the um, universal example of sheaves on the o OX, which would be formally sheaves valued in spaces. But for us, we can just say that sheaves on OX is obtained from pre-shift by enforcing the send along open sets. So we had a free construction and now we impose relations. And it turns out that the co-shift property of F is exactly the property that F tilde here, which was the extension by continuity, factor through the category of shifts along the shiftification functor. So uh, in other words, we can define co-shifts 
on X with value in A, as, by, as being just co-limits preserving functors from the universal example of sheaves. Oh, maybe let me call that thing sheaves on X, like in usual here, uh, into A. In particular, it's very nice. You, you see that you can define the category of co-sheaves as being some categorical operation applied to the category of sheaves. In particular, anything you can do with co-sheaves, you in principle should be able to reduce to the case of sheaves. Uh, moreover, if our A was R linear, meaning that we, in the infinity categorical sense, know how to take objects of A and tensor them with complexes of real vector spaces, then that thing would be the same as R linear functor, functors, co-limits preserving, from sheaves on X with values in mod R into A. This is, a, you can think of it as being a, a induction restriction for, vector, for real vector space modules in the category of categories, if you like, but it's also quite reasonable. Just can take vector space valued linear combinations of sheaves, and we still know what to do because we know how to tensor objects of A with real vector spaces. So why do I tell you all this abstract nonsense? Because now uh, I can define the tensor product. And if I have a sheaf F of, real, uh, of complexes of real vector spaces, then the operation of tensoring with F sheaves give me a map from sheaves on X to sheaves on X, which is co-limits preserving because it's tensoring with, with something. And then I have my co-sheaf, which I will now denote by G tilde prime, where G was a candidate for a co-sheaf. And this will end in A. And because G tilde prime was colimit preserving and tensoring with F was colimit preserving, also the composition is colimit preserving. So now I can just define the tensor product of G and F to be this to be the things that correspond via the diagram here above uh, to the composition. So in other words, if I want to define what is the tensor product of F and G, I am just pre-composing G with tensoring with F after I extend by continuity and R linearity. So this gives me a definition of what is a tensor product of a sheaf and a co-sheaf. Any questions about that? This was pretty abstract, I guess. And the result of this tensor product is what? It's a co-sheaf? Yeah, the, the type of the result is a co-sheaf. So from an abstract algebra perspective, the point is that sheaves form an algebra in categories and co-sheaves is just uh, the collection of functionals from this algebra into A. So this is a co-induced module and we can act on it via the co-induced structure. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, in this definition, you only use the tensor product of, of usual vector spaces over R. No, no, everything here is derived. So by sheaves on X with no, R. I mean as opposed to topological. Yeah, that is true. So again, I'm hiding a little bit of the description of A. So you should have in mind that I will always tensor only, only with constructible sheaves, which form finite dimensional vector spaces, and then the topology is fine. So in particular, there's no claim here that there is such a category A with a tensor product that commutes with co-limits. I this is not something we use. I didn't make this claim. I only act on it with finite dimensional vector spaces and maybe uh, and, and maybe uh, complete it by, by int completion, that's all. So, so okay. a posteriori, I'm using it only for Fs which are constructable and have finite dimensional underlying vector spaces on open sets. Okay, so and you do, will not it. need this even later. I this is not, not something I you need. never need it in this talk or, or, okay. or in this work at all. Okay. okay. So uh, well, now we are ready to make the definition of what are Schwartz measures on constructible yeah. sheaves. Yeah. Uh -huh. Can yeah. you repeat uh, how did you get a co-sheaf when tensoring the sheaf with a co-sheaf? Don't you get just something in A? I'm confused. No, no, no. So uh, you should think of a co-sheaf as being a, a co-limits preserving functor from sheaves to A. 
And in particular, when I compose with the operation of tensoring with F, this take as an input a functor from shifts to A and gives us an output a functor from shifts to A. Okay. What is F here? F is a shift. F, F is a constructible shift. So you can tensor shifts. I, I can ten, I can consider the operation of tensoring with F, which is an operation from shifts to shifts, and then post compose okay. it with the functional corresponding to the Cauchy. And this gives me a new functional. You, you need to think of F tensor as being a matrix and G tilde prime as being a functional. And you can apply a matrix to a functional and get a new functional. Okay. okay? Great. Uh, okay, so I, I guess we already discussed this, but let me now specialize. Uh, so if we now have a Nash manifold X, then, then one can define what is an infinity categorical version of a constructible shift. Well, that would be just a shift of complexes of real vector spaces, as opposed to complexes of shifts of real vector spaces, with the properties that restrict and restriction to a semi-algebraic stratification uh, is uh, consisting of a uh, locally constant, or in this case, you can even choose constant um, uh, shifts of complexes of finite dimensional uh, real vector spaces. So uh, even the definition of constructible shift here is some, somewhat simpler than the classical, you don't need to go to the cohomologies to test constructability. You can just ask it on the level of the actual object of the category of complexes. In any case, uh, well, now if I want to make sense of the notion F tensor smooth measures um, on X, then no problem. Why? Because smooth measures are a Cauchy. Well, what does it mean for smooth measures to be a Cauchy that would require us, well, classically it's a Cauchy in the sense of a Cauchy of vector spaces or even topological vector spaces, but in the one categorical sense. I claim that it's actually a Cauchy in the infinity categorical sense, which is a different statement. On the other hand, the claim is that this object is sufficient, sufficiently a cyclic to pass through this infinity categorification process. So, what would be the requirement? The requirement would be that uh, the mere Vietoris axiom, this one, this time uh, raised in terms of uh, Cauchy, so it's kind of trans transposed in the right sense. So we want this to be a push out in the infinity category of complexes of topological vector spaces. Now, uh, all those things are just topological vector spaces and not complexes, but the, the property of being a push out is different than the property of being a push out in, in, the, in the corresponding one category. So said differently, we want the sequence. Ah, uh, no. goes to smooth measures on x on u1 plus smooth measures on x of u2 goes to smooth measures on x on u1 union with u2. We want this to be exact. That would be the mere Vietoris axiom. But actually to get um, what we really want, which if you remember, we wanted to have a homotopy equivalence um, we wanted to have a homotopy equivalence and not only a quasi isomorphism to not be in, for not having to care so much about the topology of the topological vector spaces. And for this to be the case, we really need this sequence not only to be exact or strictly exact, we actually need it to be split exact. Fortunately, a splitting is provided by a tempered partition of unity which is uh, another part of the fundamental theory of Schwarz sections of bundles on Nash manifolds uh, I discussed earlier. So there is a section and the reason is by tempered partition of unity. So uh, to, to be more precise, uh, there is partition of unity for Nash manifolds, but, but also we need to demand that the functions in the partition of unity itself don't 
destroy the, the, the Schwarzness property. So we really want them to, to be nicely behaved enough that it actually gives a section not on the level of smooth functions, but actually on Schwarz functions. And this requires this temperedness condition that I will not describe precisely. Um, okay, so, uh, so, so in particular, smooth measures are, are, are a co-shift in the infinity categorical sense, and in particular, it can be tensored with a shift in the infinity categorical sense described above. Now, this is a very powerful uh, thing, because on one hand, we got from our completely fundamental reasons without having to um, see, to locate any specific one categorical phenomena that we derive, we got immediately from completely categorical considerations an operation which take into account all the so-called higher coherences that uh, we want. And, and also it is colimits preserving in both coordinates, essentially by definition. This means in particular, so if we resolve F by basic shifts like I described above, so if we re resolve F by mean of direct sums of extension by zeros, then now not as a definition, but as a formula, I can use it to compute the tensor product because having a resolution transform in the infinity categorical world into the statement that there is some colimit diagram. So because this operation commutes with colimits, I get that my formula, my heuristic formula upstairs is true, not because I define it this way, but because it is just a colimits preservation. Uh, and in particular, that thing that was defined using infinity categories and some abstract stuff become now something very explicit. If I have my shift F, all I need to do is to resolve it by extensions by zeros. And then I will get a complex computing this guy, which is composed of uh, just extension maps of sections from small open sets and uh, to, to big open sets and linear combinations of those. So uh, this really, on one hand, give us a definition which doesn't require any choices, and in particular, not any verification of independence. It gives us something which is also coherent in the infinity categorical sense, so we don't need to be worried so much about higher homotopies, coherences, and stuff. And also, it reduces to the correct formula we wanted on the one categorical shadow, namely on the homotopy category of all the stuff I define. So, uh, so that is probably the, the, the new output of this project, which is like the, the main thing, all the rest are more or less um, outcomes. Also, recall that the definition used the fact that co-shifts are simply functionals on shifts. In particular, more or less every statement I can met, make about shifts, so base change, projection formula, all stuff like that, just transform to the tensor product of a shift and co-shift by just post-composing with a functional which is, turns out to be quite important to what we want to do. So now uh, let me uh, uh, pass to a, a sketch of the, of, the, of the proof. So a proof of what? Now we have a well-defined statement, which is this statement. We can now make sense of the left-hand side and the right-hand side, where F was, well, something like this. I will, something like this, I will, um, explain now exactly what. And in particular, we have uh, two sides which we want to compare. We can now rigorously ask whether these two sides are comparable. And let, let me now uh, just uh, make one remark that, uh, well, the, this statement, which is a statement about topological vector spaces on Nash manifolds, so it's more or less a pre-dual taking care of the topology of statements, which in some sense appear in the work of Kashiwara and Shapira. Uh, so um, there was a question in the chat. What is the definition of the left hand side? So this is the twisted ram complex of of F. Um, so uh, it was introduced here. It's a complex whose terms are Schwarz sections of certain vector bundles, Nash vector bundles on X, but the maps between them are not maps of bundles, but rather differentiable, differential, Nash differential operators. And this is up to normalization and shift just to the RAM complex. It's the thing whose zeros term is the Schwartz measures, and then we extend it to the left in the only way possible to make it at the RAM complex. 
Well, that's the definition. It's a slightly different. It's supposed to, instead of computing the homologies of the fiber, the homology of the fiber with compact support, it's supposed to compute. Uh, it's supposed to compute the uh, homologies of the fiber. So, so let me now uh, repeat uh, what we want. So uh, let me now make a precise statement. Again, um, we are having something slightly twisted. So first we have uh, the Schwartz, the RAM complex of F twisted, which is now an object in the category of Cauchy on X with coefficients in A. We can, because we have a map from X to Y, then usual theory, and again, infinity categorically, it just uh, the ontology one does not have to derive any functor to get it. We have a functor f lower shrik from cauchy's on x and a to cauchy's on y with coefficients in a. Here, this lower shrik is might seem like something related to push forward with proper support, but for cauchy's, I denote by the lower shrik just the usual push forward obtained by evaluating at pre images. Because it is the left adjoint, I denote it by the lower shriek, and also because it is naturally the dual in the sense of taking functionals from the upper star, which is what, uh, in an ultimate theory, lower shriek should stand for. So, um, so we have this lower shriek operation, which is defined basically by by this property, and this takes Cauchy's to Cauchy's, of course, uh, in the infinity categorical sense, and uh, and, and then we also have a map from the push forward of the relative the RAM complex to the bit twisted to um, the integration map. And the claim is that now what we need to take here is going to be smooth, smooth measures on X, which is a Cauchy on X. So left hand side is a Cauchy of Y. Y. And uh, so, so uh, we need to take it, but we need to take into account the homologies. And well, I will denote by F lower sharp, the functor that take into account not the, that, that counts the homologies of the fiber. So formally speaking, this will be a left adjoint to the upper star, which is up to a twist by a local system in the input is just the lower shake. So, uh, and then, well, theorem, that thing is an equivalence. There, there will be a canonical map that I will, during the proof introduce, and moreover, these two things will be an equivalent. So uh, before I go to give the sketch of the argument of how, how one shows this using all this machinery, any questions about the statement or something? Okay, if not, let me now, I prepare in advance. Uh, the, 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 yes. Yes. Can you repeat what is, uh, how is this uh, lower, uh, I don't know what to call it. Lower sharp. So uh, for, for us, F lower sharp of F would be just F lower shriek of F. Well, here now I mean the push forward with proper support of sheaves, tensored with some local system that in this case will be the orientation bundle inverse, but it really doesn't matter. Well, with some shift. So uh, the functor f upper shriek has a left adjoint f lower shriek, but in our case f upper shriek is also f upper star tensored with something invertible, and therefore f upper star also have a left adjoint, which I denote by f lower sharp. Okay, this is a standard notation in some fields of mathematics. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, how can I ask also? Yes, okay, maybe I missed something, but can you can you think of SDR as in some sense? Uh, pullback of constant shift and then this becomes like a projection formula? This is an excellent question in the sense that this is what is going to appear in the next slide, if you can call it a slide. So uh, um, as uh, part of the audience is uh, really fast, uh, now here is how we prove it. So first of all, we have to make a Poincaré lemma, which means a local statement. So here we take contractible fibers, but we also demand some local, nice lo structure, global structure on F, which we have to think of as being a local building block for our objects. So 
um, we will take maps which are composition of open embedding into X times L and then projection to X with connected fibers. So there is here a hidden uh, geometric statement, which is the analog of the existence of small contractible neighborhoods on a convex neighborhoods on a manifold or something, which is the statement that, well, every Nash submersion is locally over the source, a composition of such maps. So uh, this is not a completely trivial statement, but it is doable within the very standard knowledge about uh, geometry of semi-algebraic spaces that we already have. Well, um, anyway, we didn't find an exact uh, reference for this specific statement. So, uh, we have some proof of it, but but in any case, uh, it's it, it, I believe it's something very standard. Um, for for such maps, we can just by hand compute a homotopy inverse to the integration map using the same formulas in the Poincaré lemma, and then one just have to verify that the growth is not destroyed. This is a well an easy exercise in a interchange of integration and derivatives and stuff like that, one can see that you really get a homotopy equivalence, not only a quasi-isomorphism, an actual honest homotopy equivalence. So there is in particular a section to this map uh, in the case where F is very small. So we call this very small. And then, well, one have to show also that the collection of maps satisfying our niceness properties is closed under composition. And then we get something which is really a local model for every nice submersion. Well, this statement, when, when we take into account the fact that neighborhoods which looks like compositions of very small maps are basis for a topology, uh, well, uh, uh, ignoring here some technicalities about uh, niceness properties of sheaves on X, this gives us that the mate of the integral. So the integral is a map from the lower shriek of the left-hand side to the right-hand side. And because lower shriek was a left adjoint, we can take the mate and pass to the map to the right adjoint. And well, the fact that locally this map is an equivalence gives us that globally, but uh, we, we have this equivalence, which is an equivalence inside Cauchy's on the source. So this statement is really, this, the statement that there is such a map is global, but the fact that it's an equivalence is really local on the source. Um, and, and therefore, uh, this map is an equivalence of Cauchy's. Now we can take the map, the, this local map we have, and, and now push it forward back to X. And then what we get is an equivalence between the original left hand side we wanted and something that looked like the naive right hand side, except that now it is pulled and then pushed again. And then we really need to end up with some projection formula. And we need to be able to relate the pull and the push of a Cauchy shift to what happened when we tensor it with the push of the constant shift. And well, again, because Cauchy shifts are just a formula applied to shifts, this reduces uh, to, the, uh, to the projection formula for proper maps on spaces. This is just a consequence of projection formula for sheaves. And well, we end up with the result we wanted. So uh, in the last two minutes, let me give you two applications of this and I will not have the time to discuss the proofs. So first of all, this recover what we wanted. If we have a map F from X to Y, then uh, well, if it have a cyclic fibers, then uh, the, integ the naive integral map without this twist that we did with pushing and pulling is just an equivalence. And this is because the canonical map from the push of the constant shift of X to the constant shift of Y is an equivalence. It's really something that measures the topology of the fibers. So if the fibers are cyclic, it's just a constant shift. And another more analytic statement which you can deduce is the following. So in, in this business, it is very uh, nice to have complexes in which all the differentials are closed maps. Because otherwise we will have something which is like an almost boundary, which is not a boundary, which is sort of annoying. So we want all the complexes to have house law homologies. Now, it turns out that these relative ram complexes, even though, unlike the absolute case, they have infinite dimensional homologies. So it's not a consequence of uh, having co-final dimension of the differentials, but still it has house law homologies. And the reason is that we can reduce it to a claim about the tensor product of smooth measures. 
and a constructable shift. And resolving the constructible shift by direct sums of open sets is reduced to a statement about very explicit complexes that we can just now come up with some proof that the differentials are closed. I will not have time to describe this come up thing. So uh, now it's just 5.30, so I guess this is a good time to stop uh, and uh, ask if there are any questions. Okay, so thank you, Shahan. Uh, questions, please. So many questions we asked during the talk, but are there any further questions? Okay, then maybe I will ask a question. Maybe you can tell us how you apply this theorem. Oh, okay, so, so um, the way this theorem is applied um, is the following. The original question we were trying to solve is the following. Suppose we have a, a Nash stack, which is not something I defined here, but to first approximation, we have some action of a Nash group on a Nash manifold. And we want to know that uh, the Schwartz measures on this stack, which is some complex uh, defined by Sakalaridis um, over the stack is, is something reasonable. So reasonable would mean in this case, first have Hausdorff homologies. This we have no idea how to prove yet, but we have some directions. Uh, and the other is that it have only finitely many homologies. So it's kind of a finite thing. And well, this is a work in even more in progress than this one. So I don't want to make statements yet, but, but the idea is that it's very useful to have this kind of argument because then whenever we have a map of stacks with contractible fibers, we can always replace the Schwarz measures on the target, which is supposed to be thought of as more complicated with larger stabilizers into the into a finite complex of, of, of things that looks like Schwarz measures up to some twists on the source, which is supposed to be much more simple. And therefore, this allows us to descend the statement of finite homological dimension for stacks along maps with uh, uh, contractible fibers, which is a useful maneuver in this kind of business. So, so this is the origin of the question. Thank you very much. Further questions? All right, so uh, we, this week we will have one more talk. On, it will be on Friday on the same time, 4.30 by Jerusalem time. It, it will be by Galdor. And next week at the usual time and day on Wednesday, we will have a talk of Steve Miller. All right, thank you for connecting, virtually coming. Thank you, Shachar, again.